Great. All right, everyone, welcome to this week's Tech Talk uh, presented by the Tech Academy. My name is Kenzie, and we also have Rick here from the Tech Academy, and we are joined by three staffers from Tech Systems here in Portland. Uh, they connect uh, job seekers with employers at over 100 companies in the Pacific Northwest and elsewhere. And they're here to give you some advice about entering the workforce as a boot camp graduate. Um, specifically in the areas of app development and cybersecurity, but is a general coder as well. And um, they are going to be um, giving a talk. I'm going to be monitoring the chat box for any questions. And uh, feel free to participate and uh, leave me questions, and I will let them take it away. Perfect. Well, thanks guys for having us. I'm uh, excited to, to speak with you all and tell, uh, tell you guys a little bit about tech systems and, and what it is that we do. So i um, joined here by a couple of my colleagues, Ellie O'Brien and Ishan Mehta. We are um, all recruiters with tech systems. Um, so tech systems is an IT staffing and services company. So one of the largest in the country, actually, we have offices um, all across the country in almost every major city. So, uh, you know, no matter where you're at, there, there's a good chance that you're, you know, probably located near a tech systems office. Um, like she said, we work with about 100 different clients, uh, at least up here in the Portland metro area. But we also work with many of the Fortune 500 companies across the country as well. Um, so. Just to, to tell you a little bit about, um, you know, what it is that we do and, and kind of the benefit that we provide to folks like yourself. So um, <clears throat> we work directly with hiring managers at all these companies. We have a full team of uh, account managers that have direct relationships with these account managers. And, you know, really where the benefit in that is, is, uh, you know, these hiring managers are, are super busy people and, um, you know, they might throw a, a job posting online and they get 50 to 100, 200 resumes for one job posting, and they're flipping through them, you know, 15, 30 seconds, just glancing at them real quick. And it's, you know, it's easy to kind of get lost in the stack there. Um, so where our benefit comes is we have that direct relationship. They trust us. They trust our vetting process. So, um, you know, we, we do our, our due diligence in terms of vetting out candidates. We do a couple reference checks. We meet with the candidate either in person or obviously in the last year, it's been, um, you know, over a Zoom call or something like that. Um, but really just to find out, you know, hey, are, is this a good fit for, for, you know, for yourself, but also the company in terms of, you know, a culture fit as well as, you know, is it what they're looking for technically? Um, and, you know, our job as recruiters is to, you know, build that relationship with you folks, you know, find out what's your skills, goals, interests, you know, what do you want to do not only right now, but, um, you know, let's say five years down the road, where would you like to be at in your career at that point? And, and you know, how can we be the best resource for you? to get you, you know, to where you need to be both now and in the future as well. So, um, you know, we provide a lot of different services, you know, we would provide career coaching, some, some interview coaching, you know, resume tips, that kind of thing. Um, always happy to answer any questions, you know, about the market or, uh, you know, about if you have a question about, Hey, you know, what, what kind of role would it would be a, a good fit for me or, you know, anything like that, you know, we're always happy to help out with that. And, um, you know, ideally our, our goal at the end of the day is to connect, you know, both you guys with a company that fits, you know, fits what you're looking for, but also fits with the company, what they're looking for out of an employee, you know, out of someone who's going to fit in well with the culture, um, someone who's going to, you know, have the technical skills and, and, and you know, have that motivation to, you know, step into the company and, and hopefully grow within that company or, um, you know, something like that. So um, we, we specialize in a lot of different areas. I myself specialize in IT support. So, um, you know, your help desk, desktop support kind of stuff. Um, but we also, we know, we also work on, on the networking side of things, infrastructure, um, application development, cybersecurity, you name it, uh, you know, we, we do it in IT. So, um, you know, whatever your interest is, we're, we're likely to have somebody who specializes in that area and is going to be able to help you out. For example, Ellie specializes in cybersecurity, Ishan specializes on the application side, um, and, you know, both really understand their area of expertise and are, you know, are, are really spun up to speed on, on the market and that kind of thing. So, um, so just to talk a little bit about, about myself and what I do, like I said, I specialize in IT support, which I do understand a lot of you guys are here for, you know, cybersecurity or application development, anything like that. Um, but you know, one thing that, that I always recommend to folks who, you know, who might be in school, like you guys are, who are going through the program and, um, 
you know, you might be looking for part-time work while you're, while you're attending the program or something like that. We do see like some part-time help desk roles or desktop support roles, anything like that. Um, and, you know, I think that provides a good opportunity just to at least get your foot in the door, you know, within the IT industry, but also, you know, if, if maybe there's a company that, um, you know, that you're specifically interested in working for. So, for example, we work with like Providence Health, Legacy Health, uh, Northwest Natural, Adidas, Columbia Sportswear, just to name a few, you know, a few of the big companies that kind of catch a lot of people's eye. Um, we do work with companies like that. And, you know, if it is something you're, you're interested in, you know, IT support could possibly be, you know, a good way to get your, get your foot in the door with a company like that. And, um, you know, within the IT industry to kind of help you get your career off the ground and, and, and up and running and that kind of thing. So, um, yeah, I always just like to throw it out there. You know, I know it's not long term what you, what your goals are here, and um, but you know, it could help you get you get you know get you to where you need to be down the road for sure. So, um, I will uh, go ahead and hand it off to Ellie. She'll talk a little bit about the the cybersecurity space and, and some of the companies that we work with it, with in that space here in Portland. Hey guys, um, I'm Ellie O'Brien, and I've been with Tech Systems for. Uh, about five years, a little over that. Um, always have been really passionate about information security, cybersecurity, um, and more recently, so I sit physically out of the Portland office with Ishan and Sam, um, but I also am a, a, a lead over a delivery team of specialized security recruiters um, for our delivery center, which we have a, a few um, since Tech Systems is, you know, works with. I mean, 80% of the Fortune 500. So you can imagine how many customers have have demands. Um, but uh, the delivery center is in Phoenix, and uh, my team of about eight um, supports customer delivery and security uh, staffing needs. So um, uh, with every you know with COVID, um, a lot of the workforce has gone remote. So. Um, you know, we, we have had definitely an increase of bit like remote business um, that sit, you know, with customers um, nationally. But in the Portland market, um, Nike would be um, a huge customer of ours within the security space. Um, Fisher Investments is another one. Um, a lot of the healthcare systems, although healthcare has, I've seen a decrease in staffing. Um, uh, but I, I'm not sure if Sam or Ishan would say the same, but within the security space, um, uh, I, I've seen lower um, hiring needs for our healthcare um, clients. Um, and then off the top of my head, yeah, some utility companies like Bonneville Power, PGE, Northwest Natural. Um, those are just a, a few I can think of off the top of my head. And yeah, I guess. <laughs> okay, go ahead, Ishan. Yeah, I, thanks for uh, having me and Sam and Ellie. Thanks for teeing this up as well. Um, so my specialization, sort of what's, what Sam was saying, is more so focused within the application space. So my role is similar to Sam and Ellie in that uh, I help assist in connecting individuals like yourself with a role that's going to be best for your career development, what you want to do in the future, but also what our customers are looking for. And there's a lot of crossover with some of the customers that Ellie named off in terms of the application space. So big one, of course, is going to be Nike. Um, they typically will hire Java and AWS, uh, that combination of skill set very, very frequently, since that's what a lot of their applications are built on and almost all of Nike aside from a small portion is going to be hosted on AWS so um, you know for those that are interested in a career path there those are a couple technologies to uh, that I would recommend familiarizing yourself with um, other customers that have that we've worked with pretty frequently here in Portland for uh, applications are going to be Kroger um, the Northwest Evaluation Association, or NWEA, um, Cambia Healthcare, Providence Healthcare, although to Ellie's point, there has also been 
a decrease in staffing from the application side as well. I think part of that was because they had to hire a lot of contractual nurses to handle the things going on with COVID. So it kind of took away from the t IT budgets. But um, historically, we have always seen a lot of application based projects out of those big customers as well. Um, so without going into too many others, PGE would be another one, US Bank and Umqua are a couple of the uh, financial customers that we work with. So we do work with customers in all sorts of verticals from healthcare to finance, retail. Um, and a big trend in application development space, at least, is having experience with some sort of cloud technology, whether that's GCP, Azure, or AWS. Those are definitely, um, it seems like it's required by most companies now, even if it's not professional experience, getting your certifications and those things. So you can at least say that you've had exposure to those things or have done some coursework and, and those types of technologies. Those are going to be what companies are looking for. Um, Java traditionally will be paired up with AWS and the C -sharp .net stack with a lot of our Azure customers. So um, that's that's kind of a very high level overview of the application space within Portland. Um, I guess uh, I'll turn it back over to Sam and we can start fielding questions that you guys might have. And I see some questions in the chat, so maybe folks can start asking those and we can provide some answers. Yeah, yeah, I would say if you have a question, go ahead and throw it in the chat. I feel like that'd be better than everyone trying to jump in at the same time. So um, I see the question here from Joseph about uh, the best way to go about applying for a part time position. So um, so how it works with with tech systems and what we do. So we don't have any specific job postings to apply to. Um, what we go ahead and do is uh, we go through our vetting process. So we'll talk with you on the phone. We'll, you know, we'll talk through what it is you're looking for, talk through the role, make sure that, you know, it is a good fit and, you know, it is something you want to move forward with. Um, at that point, we would set up a, a virtual meeting. Um, you know, over Zoom, WebEx, or, or, or Google Meet, anything like that, just to kind of, um, you know, dig a little bit deeper in terms of, you know, some long-term goals and, and just to really solidify and, and ensure, you know, hey, is, is this, you know, a position that you do want to move forward with? Um, at that point, we'll get a couple of reference checks done. And then once that happens, we will throw that all into what we call a submittal package. Um, so we'll include the resume, a short write-up on, on um, you know, just what we've talked about and then also those references as well. Um, and then we send that over to our account manager who then sends that over to the hiring manager at, you know, whatever company it is that, that we're working with. Um, so there's no formal application process. And um, really what the point of the submittal package is, is it kind of, you know, obviously provides a little bit more than just a resume on, the, on that manager's desk. Um, you know, gives them a little bit more to look at it. And, and, you know, they have more, a little bit more confidence and reassurance that, hey, you know, they've done their vetting, they feel good about this candidate. That's what, you know, that, that's what we're paid to do is, is to find these folks for these companies. So, um, so that's the best way to go about it. So, you know, if it is something you're, you're interested in, um, you know, applying for a part-time position or, or looking for part-time work while you are in school or going through this program, um, I think the best way to, to do it would be to reach out to, to myself or, you know, you know, find another recruiter at Tech Systems to reach out to. Um, I can drop my email in the chat if you wanted to, to send me an email. But, yeah, we can just start that process, go through it. You know, if we do have some part time positions open for you, we can kind of talk through that. Um, and if it is something you'd like to move forward with, then we just need to get that submittal package all wrapped up and then we can get that over to the manager and go from there. So um, does that make sense? Perfect. I see one in here from Brett. How important is a well-designed portfolio in getting hired as a web developer? I think that um, what Sam was saying in terms of the submittal package, that's across the board with all of the positions that we hire for. So if you do have a, a well-designed portfolio, I definitely would include it. It's not always mandatory. Some of our clients don't ask for it. Some of them do, but if you do have one it it gives you you know another another factor that can separate you from other people that are being submitted to that position and it gives the hiring manager an ability to go in there and check that out for themselves they can see how you design your portfolio what the code looks like underneath the hood and 
Um, because we are talking to these hiring managers directly, they can direct questions back to us. Whereas if you were, you know, applying for something online and you submitted your portfolio, you don't really even know if the, the hiring manager is going to see that. So um, I think if you have a well-designed portfolio, it's always good to include that when you're, you know, working with us because we can tell the hiring manager, hey, look, they also have a portfolio for you to take a look at. And again, it can help separate you from this, from the competition. Um, so I hope that helps. Um, I have another question in here from uh, Marcia Garcia asking when the next tech systems web developer bootcamp intensive starts. I would recommend adding to the wait list and then that will probably tell you when the next global services um, training or boot camp will be. Um, I, th I think this is um, a fairly recent program. Ishan, do you know more about the, the boot camp? It looks like our GS is putting it on. Um, I think it is. It's fairly new. So unfortunately, I actually don't know too much about the boot camp, but I'll drop my um, email in this chat here and I can connect with you afterwards and get get some more uh, information on that for you, Marcia. Yeah, and I see one here. Um, are any of your clients smaller companies and or in the arts? So um, I'm not sure about, you know, specifically in the arts. I know that we do work with a lot of companies we do work with are, you know, enterprise level, bigger companies, but, um, you know, we've had experience working with some, some smaller shops some you know, companies that have, you know, 10, 12, 15 employees. So, um, for example, we worked with a company called Ankara Moisson, uh, which is an architecture firm located here in Portland. We helped them out with, uh, with some projects they had last year and then, um, unfortunately COVID hit, so they kind of had to dial back on some of their IT needs, but, um, we do work. Yeah, we do work with some, with some smaller companies, you know, and that's kind of, um, like I said, you know, when we're trying to figure out, you know, skills, goals, interests, that kind of thing, you know, if it is a smaller environment we're looking, you're, you're looking for, um, you know, that's something we take into account and, and you know, kind of keep that in mind when we're looking for, for positions for, yeah. All right, I see another question in here. Um, let me find it, sorry. I think it's from Devin. Um, he said, if we're currently working with someone at Tech Systems on a particular position, should we continue to work with them or reach out to more of you if, say, Ishan specializes in web development and the other might not? I would say um, if, so each, of us like on this call, our office is similar to this call in that um, we all have different specialties that we specialize in. So if the person, and we'll, work, we'll all see the same positions, we just have a better knowledge of, for example, like Ellie's a security expert, Sam has his expertise with the workstations and the sort of the dynamic workspace area and mine is in the uh, web development space. So if the person that you're working with has a good grasp on um, those sorts of positions and the technologies that you're working with, then I would say continue working with them. Um, but internally, we always, you know, for example, if I came across a security person, I don't know too much about that space. So internally, I would likely just introduce them to Ellie so that they're more aligned to somebody in that realm of expertise. We also um, have a database where we, you know, after every conversation with a candidate, we log some, you know, just pertinent pertinent information so that, you know, we're able to remember, um, you know, skills, goals, and interests. So, um, so say Frank is working with Ishan and um, Frank wants to work with me, you know, we're able to look in the system and see the notes that the, the previous recruiter um, has entered in the system, what, uh, what positions Ishan has been working with Frank on, um, just to make things more simple and organized for you all. Looks like we had another question about um, 
certificates in the software development space. Ishan, I'm not sure if you have um, you know any suggestions there. Yes. Okay. So this question from Drew around other certificates within software development that could be beneficial. Um, more and more software developers are also starting to be expected to have the capabilities of a DevOps engineer in terms of deploying their code to AWS. So, I mean, the cloud, the cloud certifications are going to be the most important, whether they're AWS or Azure. I think there's a couple different types that you can get within those two, but outside of the cloud, um, I think Jenkins offers uh, certifications and so does Ansible. Those are tools that um, are used to deploy code to the cloud. I believe Docker has a certification too. So if you want to showcase your ability to not only be able to develop code, but also deploy it yourself, I would recommend maybe some certifications in those areas as well to sort of strengthen your resume. Um, so Gregory asked, does location matter? You are based in Portland, but I am in Massachusetts. Would you be able to get me to someone more local? Yeah, absolutely. So like I said, we, we have offices all across the country, um, you know, located in every major city, but also, you know, we have a couple in each state. So, um, you know, it's pretty easy for us to reach out to someone, you know, for example, in the Massachusetts office and say, hey, you know, we, we've got a candidate here, Gregory, he, you know, they're looking for, um, you know, some sort of an opportunity, would you be able to reach out to them and, uh, you know, kind of find out what they're looking for and, and see what you can do for them. Also, you know, uh, you know, we mentioned the remote piece and, um, you know, it's kind of made it easier with COVID. That's, you know, the one thing that's kind of made things easier is, you know, it has provided more remote roles for folks. So, um, you know, sitting in Massachusetts, we might have an opportunity for you here in Portland that, you know, might be a good fit for you, might be fully remote. Um, you know, that, that that's another option for you as well. You know, if that's something that interests you too, if, if, if remote is something that, you know, catches your eye. And then RJ asked, do you guys recommend or offer resume review and resume write service, uh, especially with respect to tech, the tech management domain? Yeah, so, um, sorry, Ellie. <laughs> yeah, so we do. So typically, um, you know, whatever recruiter you end up working with, you know, our job is to, you know, be a resource for you any way we can. So, you know, if, if you needed some tips on, you know, how to draft up a resume and, and get it to, you know, to catch in a, a hiring manager's eye, you know, we're more than happy to provide that service for you. So, um, you know, I know that's that is part of our training is to kind of get trained up a little bit on, you know, what a good resume looks like, what people are looking for. Uh, you know, I think the most important thing to keep in mind, a lot of, you know, a lot of folks when writing their resume, they, they try to keep it really concise and keep it, you know, to one page, you know, and, you know, I think it's important to keep it, you know, as short as possible and, um, you know, keep it concise, but not, not so much to the point where you're leaving out a lot of details on what it is exactly that you're doing. Um, I think it's important to, you know, list the technologies that you've used, but also list, you know, how you've used them, give, give some examples of maybe some projects you've done or, um, you know, just any work you've, you've done in the past with those tools. And um, I think that's the biggest thing that, you know, will stand out to a hiring manager rather than, you know, looking through it's like, oh, you know, they've worked with, JavaScript and, and da 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 da. What have you done with it? You know, you can't really tell what they've done with it. So I think, you know, adding a little bit of detail, not being overly concise, is an important thing to keep in mind. Yeah, I think like the, we don't write resumes for anyone. Like I could never, I, like I don't have the bandwidth for that. And I, and it's, it's hard to, you know, it's hard to write a resume. It's, it's something that is your own and, um, you know, only you can really do that. But, um, I definitely, I always am giving advice on resumes. Hey, you should expand on this piece in your resume per this, uh, job that you, you want to go for. Um, I think, similarly to what Sam was saying, you know, the technology or the product, right, paired with um, the situation or the task, why you're using that, uh, at what size environment are you using it? Um, a good, a good um, template, I guess, um, in explaining, you know, um, what you're, what you're doing on a day to day with a, a specific technology is the star format, which is situation, 
task, action, and result. Um, so explaining, you know, bullet by bullet, um, you know, what that looks like. Um, a lot of the times too, if someone is, is like, I don't know how to format, like, um, I'll, I have a few, um, folks that I work really close with and we have really good, I have a really good relationship with them and they, they, they trust me to, um, they allow me to use their resume, scrubbed information, you know, no personal information, of course, but um, uh, scrub their personal information off their resume and then show it as an example of um, a good format to use and um, how they explain how they're using the specific technology they're using. So. That's great. I love that STAR framework for um, writing resumes. That's super useful. Uh, Joshua asked, what are your thoughts about remote roles for someone that is fresh to the tech industry, maybe in a junior role? Seems like the mentorship that is offered in person would be more difficult to offer in a remote situation. I think that, I mean, of course, right now everything is remote, but in the scenario where you have the option of going in on site versus uh, being remote, I think that there's a lot to be said about being able to be coached by a more senior engineer on the team and someone who can offer mentorship. And like, for example, even right now, me being remote versus when I was in the office, like if I had a question, um, I could just pop into somebody's office and just get that question answered immediately, get advice, get mentorship very quickly. Um, whereas now it's a little bit more difficult to do so. And I'd imagine, you know, in a junior role where you're just starting out fresh in the tech industry, you want that accessibility. So I, again, I think it can depend on the person as well, but I, I would say that it, you probably gain a lot of benefit being in a situation where you have that accessibility to just seek mentorship by talking to the person on your right rather than in a remote you know virtual environment all right i think that covers most of the questions that are currently in the chat box um, unless i miss something so if you typed a question in and i haven't read it out um, let me know raise your hand and we can have you ask the question yourself so a question i do have if somebody is um, looking for a remote job and they want that specifically um how hard is that now i mean i know things have opened up with covid for remote work um how hard is it for someone to find like just remote at the moment we always are able to work with our customers to qualify business and understand okay is this going to be a remote position just through covid or is this going to be a remote position long term um so that that expectation is set prior to the candidate interviewing and, and whatnot. You know, definitely don't want to waste anyone's time on like, oh no, I, I only want to work remote moving forward. And then the the same database that I mentioned that we um you know hold our hold candidate profiles, uh, it's a Salesforce based system. Um, that same system holds all of our requirements on a national scale, and there's indication of what um, positions are 100% remote long term. So it's pretty easy for us to do, do like a quick search on a national scale for remote roles. Got it. Thank you. Uh, I see Joshua has their hand up. Would you like to ask a question? Go for it. Unmute yourself and ask your question. Hi, guys. This is Josh. Um, first of all, thanks Tech Academy for putting this on. Thank Tech Systems for being here, uh, providing great information. Uh, I had a question about <clears throat> kind of more circles around uh, the cybersecurity side, and it also branches into application development and just IT in general. Um, how is it viewed for like criminal background checks? Like I know they can be more on a one on one situation, but like in the cybersecurity, where are the, I guess never never ones 
you know, like the systems, like insurance, I could see that, healthcare, possibly. But is there any like that you've seen like wiggle room for someone that used to have or does have, you know, a past criminal be- record to move up in one of these areas? So, I mean, as long as, you know, it's old and you've put in the work, I mean, do those things kind of be taken in consideration? Yeah, so um, each of our customers if if the position is a contract or contract to hire position, um, we know from our customer what level background check they need us to perform for them. So if that's a seven year, ten year credit, um, whatnot. So it gets tricky when you ask the recruiter on like what is the customer's background check look like Mm -hmm. um i think you can feel free to ask that but then when you get the response if you have any concerns i wouldn't voice those because then that comes you know that becomes kind of a discrimination issue um you know if someone has uh, a bad background um you know like a i can't pass a drug test or something then I can't, as the recruiter, say, well, then, you know, you can't get the job because technically I'm, I'm discriminating. Um, You would have to like, yeah. So just be careful with what uh, information you're providing. The recruiter doesn't care. Right. But it puts us in a tricky situation. Yeah. Understandable. Yeah. I looked up Oregon law and any wage or salary over 70,000, they can go back. I think it's about almost 20 years. So for a background check, I don't know if that's enforced or not, but it was a concern. I've never had too much if you issue in other industries. Um, there was no theft or anything like that, but it is a, a barrier to entry for me. But I plan on, you know, having a solid foundation and working through that. Thanks, guys. Thanks, Joshua. That's honestly a really good question, and I appreciate your vulnerability in asking that question. Um, you know, lots of people have made decisions at some point in their life and then want to make different decisions. And it can be really, really frustrating when that uh, wall that when that's cut off for you, when you have decided that, you know, you would like to do, you know, make some different choices. So appreciate you bringing that up because it's definitely something that applies to other people as well. Um, So Damon asked, how do you think the tech industry will change in the next five to 10 years? Um, I think that it's going to get more focused around, of course, like I know I've brought the cloud up a couple times. You guys are probably sick of hearing me say it, but I think everything's going to revolve around being able to understand, you know, how, how to deploy to the cloud. You know, a huge trend right now is moving on premises applications to the cloud. So I think that trend will continue. I think the area of expertise that Ellie focuses in in terms of cybersecurity is going to is going to continue to grow exponentially as well just because you know so much of our you know business so much of our data is out there right now and companies use that data to create their business decisions or you know create new applications to do you know x y and z and being able to post everything on a secure platform and make sure that it's safe from cyber threats. I mean, I think that's going to be huge over the next five to 10 years. So without going too far down to the rabbit hole, I would say cloud and security are, are going to be two major areas of focus as well as data science and AI. Awesome. Thank you. Yeah. Super interesting question. Thanks for asking. Thanks for answering. Um, Drew asks, uh, or said, I'm curious when sending out resumes, what approach do you prefer, casting a wide net with high volume or more targeted approach with lower volume? Any overall general advice on the topic is appreciated. Yeah, so I I think for that, um, you know, I think it all kind of depends on on what it is that you're looking for. You know, if, if, 
you know, in your job search, you're like, you know, I'd be okay doing this or I'd be, you know, okay doing this. If you have a few different things you're looking at, um, you know, sending out a, a lot of different resumes, high volume might be better. But, you know, if you have a, a more specific idea of kind of what it is that you want to do, you know, what kind of company you're wanting to work for, you know, culture wise, that kind of thing, um, then I think, you know, maybe a more targeted approach could, you know, could be a better, better way to go at it at that point. But, you know, I think it just depends on on each person and kind of, you know, what their job search looks like and, and you know, what kind of role and what kind of company they want to work for. I think that all comes into play with, when thinking about that. All right. And then RJ um, asked, uh, what is the best way to... Um, I think to to connect to respective recruiters in the specific domain, um, for example, workstation security, web development, et cetera, is it one to connect to the recruiter on LinkedIn or two to follow tech systems on LinkedIn or three email resume to the respective recruiter? Yeah, I, I think a good way to do it, um, you know, LinkedIn is, is a useful tool just because you could search up, you know, tech systems recruiter, Portland, Oregon, and boom, you'll, you know, 20, 30, 50 of us will pop up right there and you can reach out to us that way. Um, so, you know, that's a useful tool. Uh, you know, if you are able to, to get a hold of, of, you know, one of our email address or anything like that, then that's also, you know, a, a good way to just have that direct communication with us. Um, another, you know, another example, uh, we, when we were in the office, you know, we do have a, an office phone that you could call into and then they would send that call, um, you know, into our office and connect you to a recruiter just like that. Um, you know, obviously with us being remote, that's not too much of an option anymore. So I would say, you know, the LinkedIn email route would be best, but, um, we do have an office number on the tech systems website. Um, you know, we do occasionally have some folks working in the office. So, I mean, you're more than welcome to give that number a call and, um, you know, somebody might be on the other end to, to go ahead and pick up and connect with you. Um, but yeah, I, mean, I think LinkedIn's a useful tool. You can search us on there and then, um, you know, from there you can get our email, phone number, that kind of thing. And then we can just connect that way. Awesome. And then Adam asked, um, networking is a really valuable part of the industry. Uh, so I was wondering what pointers y'all could give on building networks with others, even as people yet to join the field. Um, I think that being able to join user groups is probably my top recommendation. There's a lot of different user groups and very specific ones too, like Node.js user group, React.js user group, um, PDX women in tech user group. There's there's so many different user groups that you can join. And I think that's a, a good entry point, a good foundation that you can get in there, talk to people, and then they probably can introduce you to other people that they've met in different user groups. So um, I think I, I'm blanking on the name. It might have been called GroupMe or something like that. There's a platform out there that you can probably just find through Google and you just put in the city that you live in and what your industry is and it'll find user groups for you. So that I think that would be a good place to start. And then um, Paul asked, as an entry level developer fresh out of boot camp, do you re recommend accepting the first job offering to simply get your foot in the door or instead focus on more of a good fit? I think that you want to make sure that the first job, I think it's a balancing act, of course, because you do want to, you know, you want to start working and, and building your uh, abilities up and what you what you're capable of but you want to be careful about offer or taking the first offer that you get because there could be that nagging feeling in the back of your mind that you know the yes this was an offer but you know how long do I really want to be here and if something better comes along uh, I, I'll leave for it and if that something better does come along two three months into your job that one thing that we as recruiters look for on resumes is you know, why you left your last position and not saying that this is something that anyone 
uh, that you would do. But if something does come along very early and after you've accepted that job offer and you just get up and leave right away, then what's to stop you from doing it again? You know, I think that there's a lot to be said about being a little patient and finding something that you can see yourself doing for a year. If, if it's a contract, seeing out that entire duration of the contract or, you know, I, I think it is a balancing act, but I, I would consider those things as well when, when evaluating your options. Yeah, I think it's, I think it's smart just to always sleep on a decision, you know, like whether it's a major purchase or a job offer, like it's completely fair to tell the recruiter or the employer, yeah, let me just, can I just sleep on this? Um, and then, I mean, just use your gut, you know, if it, if it seems like a good opportunity, then take it. But I will say experience and work is king. Like I, there's been a few people that I, that I work with where they have all these certifications, but very little work history. And I'm like, get out there, like go, you know, you have opportunities. I'm pre presenting you opportunities. Don't ever think that like taking a certification course is going to be better than like real work. So um, that's like one of my peeves. So <laughs> one of my tips, but um I feel like there was something else I was going to say, but I forget. So. Well, feel free to chime back in if you remember at some point. Um, and then I think we have a hand up. Let me check here. Max, would you like to ask a question over the microphone? If you want to, go for it. OK, uh, you say uh, people you're looking for people with a lot, you see people with a lot of certifications, but no work history. And, and uh, you say that uh, we should get, get a job because it, that's just as good, that's just as good as a certification or even better in your eyes. Thing is, some of us are, get those certifications because we want to be, we want to be more hireable because no matter how many resumes we send out, nobody will, and I'm sorry, but I'm going to be extremely uh, crude here. Nobody will fucking hire us. It's just, I have sent out hundreds of resumes and I, I've gotten maybe half a dozen responses back. So, what do we do with that? I mean, right. My my scenario, my example was based upon I was presenting jobs to someone who was saying, "I don't have the time for a job right now. I'm going to take a certification course instead." Oh. And I think that was I, I I don't think that is the right You know, there was a job in front of him basically, and he wanted to. Yeah. The search okay, now. so it, this isn't apples and oranges, it's apples and tomatoes. Yeah, maybe so. Totally understand the frustration though, Max. It can be really tough um, to get that first job. And I don't have any direct recommendations for you, but we did have a talk with uh, Michael McCormack a couple weeks ago, and that one is up on our YouTube. And he gave some really interesting advice of different job titles to look for that are not the typical ones that we're applying to. And I would recommend maybe look, uh, I don't know if you were there or not, but maybe looking over. I think I was, one. yeah, I'm pretty sure I was there, but I'll look it over again. I just, that was some advice that I hadn't seen uh, previously that I thought was very useful. Um, but yeah, I totally sympathize with the frustration. Um, it can be really difficult. Uh, we do have another question from Bonnie. Um, and Bonnie asked, do you have advice for people with a disability? I find that even though it is illegal to discriminate against hiring a person with a disability, it's very common. Uh, should you just ignore the subject until you are hired? Yeah, I, yes, I think, well, no, not, I mean, not ignore it, but Again, similar to the the background check question, it puts the um, the recruiter in a uncomfortable 
spot because do we tell the client? Do we not? I mean, obviously we don't, right? Um, so I think it's, I think that's something that, you know, I think, I think it's important to work with a recruiter that you feel comfortable with and build that relationship with. And then once you feel comfortable, you can share that. But um, again, yeah, there's like discrimination issues that go along with that. So I don't think it's something that you share right out the gate, but like if we're getting lunch, you know, and coffees and I've been working with you for, you know, a couple months on trying to find you an opportunity, like, I think that's an appropriate time to be like, Hey, so can I ask you something, you know, um, off the radar, um, and have like an open discussion. I think that's, I think that would be fine. And Christopher said, adding to Bonnie, uh, I have the same concern. When I received a diagnosis during employment and then asked for accommodations, it felt like that was why I was let go and not hired back during the economic downturn. Uh, so is it smart to start with it? So if they don't feel, so they don't feel lied to or wait and then ask for accommodations when needed. My so my friend is going through something similar where she um, she's pregnant and you know she she's like do I tell the company that I want to hire me you know <laughs> that I I need maternity leave right when I start so I don't know it's just you shot I saw you <laughs> went off mute I think that's just such a hard I don't know if I'm equipped like I'm not HR that's for sure so yeah I. My recommendation, it's its hard to give, you know, unfortunately advice on that. Part of me would say, you know, wait and similar to um, working with a recruiter, build that trust with your employer. And, you know, when you feel that you, you have that kind of relationship with them, um, then you can kind of have that conversation. Now, if they ask, ask you, you know, point blank or something, you know, are there things that, you know, if the conversation comes up ahead of time, then I would definitely approach it head on so that they don't feel lied to. Um, yeah, I, I wish I could offer better advice on that. It's just, it definitely is a fine line and it's, and it's kind of hard to, to say which way is right and which way is wrong. Yeah, that's a tough situation as much as we like to think that because something is illegal means it's not going to happen. It's not true. Um, and I do have a question picking, piggybacking off of that. Um, I was wondering if you if you find any difference uh, between private industry and like public, like governmental agencies in that regard, just because I've noticed um, when applying myself, you know, equal employment, you know, employer, which or equal opportunity employer, which, you know, most people say they are, but in terms of like when I was applying to positions through the state uh, and local governments, it seemed like they were way more upfront about discrimination and those policies. And I was curious if maybe people have more success working in the public sector um, with different disabilities or not. I think it's not so much sector dependent. I truly think that it's as granular as who the manager is and and the person that you're speaking to directly in that interview. That's my just from, you know, what I've seen. I think that's my my feeling. I don't know if Ellie or Sam have any different thoughts on it, but I truly think that it's just very dependent on who you're going to directly be working for, not so much public versus private sector. Yeah, yeah, I, I agree with that. Um, you know, personally, just, just in the roles that we see and some of the managers that we work with, like, you know, when it comes to things like diversity, you know, everyone's got a diversity policy and everyone, you know, says they're doing this and that to, to you know, to go for, you know, a, a more diverse team. You know, some obviously 
actually do it. Some just, you know, have it as a policy and don't really capitalize on it. So for example, you know, a company that we work with is Lamb Research. Um, they're one company that is, you know, very upfront, very and like, you know, very straightforward and say, hey, you know, we want, you know, a diverse team. This is what we're looking for. And they do, they hire, you know, they hire folks that are, um, you know, they're not just hiring white males or anything like that, like, you know, for every position. So I think Ishan's right there. I think it, it does depend on, on, you know, as, as little as the manager, you know, not even necessarily the company as a whole, but it could just be the manager of a specific team. You know, he might value diverse, diversity more than, um, you know, other managers. So I think it really just depends. So I'm curious, um, jobs with cryptocurrency and blockchain, are you guys seeing a lot of uh, openings for that? I haven't seen much on that at the moment, no. I'm I would put that yeah. in the bucket of um, going back to that question on whoever asked it next five to 10 years, I would probably put that in that same bucket. Uh, I have another question from Drew. Uh, what is your biggest single piece of advice for all of us boot camp graduates with no college degree trying to get our first job in the tech industry? My biggest piece of advice is find something about yourself or your skill set, your personality that sets you apart from other people that are applying. And as soon as you get a chance to interview, don't be afraid to let it fly and just showcase you know, your personality. Because one thing about entry-level roles is managers, again, will probably see what Sam was saying between 50 and 200 res resumes through a, a job portal. If you're working through um, tech systems, that number slims down to the single digits. So if you get an opportunity to interview and speak with hiring managers, show them your personality because there, there are a lot of things outside of just what you can code and what you can program that hiring managers will look for in people. And if you show that you're coachable, you're eager to learn, you know, you you're forward thinking, you have goals in mind for the next three to five years in your career, those things can go a long way. So I would say it might sound cliche, but like, don't be afraid to be yourself and just let all aspects of your personality shine because that truly is what's going to set you apart from the other people that are applying. And uh, Joshua asked if there are any other certifications besides cloud-based that would give someone a stronger resume geared towards software development. Uh, I have found an interest in Sec DevOps. I don't know too many in in the Sec DevOps space. Um, my recommendation on where to start would be maybe Googling. Uh, some security based tools or I don't know Ellie if you know like popular security tools in the DevOps space and then going to those company websites and seeing if they offer you know courses or things like that um, that you can attain a certification in. Yeah yeah if you're looking at like DevSecOps or SecDevOps then you'd probably want to look into a more security related certification the cissp is like i've heard is defined as um, a mile wide and an inch deep so there's questions on there that are like around like physical security like you know where can you access a you know a, uh what do you use to blow out fires like questions like that but then there's also like technical security questions Fire extinguisher. Um, I've heard what was that? Yeah, thank you, fire extinguisher. Um, I've also heard really, really good things about the the GIAC SANS certifications, but those courses are like insane. Like they're so expensive. They're like three thousand dollars. So, um, but but like the G 
I think it's GCIH. Um, they're listed on their website. Those ones are are really um, good and well respected across the industry and in security. Um, and then Christopher, piggybacking off the discussion about applying with disabilities, asked if you would recommend then for us to take a proactive approach during the interview process and bring questions about diversity to the companies. Yeah, absolutely. I think it's also important to remember if it is a contract role, Tech Systems is your employer, right? So not 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 um, let's say Northwest Natural. You know, if we if we find you a contract at Northwest Natural, you know, it might you might not need to ask those questions to Northwest Natural. Um, you know, we're your we would be your employer. So um, you know, I would start with your recruiter first if if that is an option. But if it is a direct placement, full time employee uh, opportunity, then yeah. What do Sean said? Uh, Damon asked if you work with nonprofits. I know NWEA is one. Um, I like can't think of them off the top of my head. We, we do. I know Oregon Catholic Press. That's another one. Um, Short answer, yes, we do. I, I just can't think of them off the top of my head either. Um, and then RJ mentioned, I think that this was more of a suggestion to other people, but I want to just make sure that it gets out there to everyone. Um, and they said there are startup companies that hire freelance developers for short tenure, and that's a good way to gain experience um, for a resume and for the job search. And uh, Adam mentioned that exaggerated requirements and qualifications alike coupled with spam have broken the traditional labor market for everyone. There's definitely some issues there. Um, and then RJ asked, looking to relocate from Seattle to Portland, do you have any advice trying to find the right opportunity or organization? Yeah, I think um, I think for that, you know, I think it's important to, you know, just think about what it is that you're looking for. And, um, you know, like I said earlier, that's, you know, that's part of our job as well is to find out, you know, what it is, what is it that you're looking for? You know, you're making a move from Seattle down to Portland. Um, you know, what kind of a, what kind of a role are you looking for? What kind of a company culture are you looking for? Um, that kind of thing. That's a good conversation to have, you know, with your recruiter, um, you know, that way that, you know, when you do make that make that move down you know maybe we'll have something ready for you when you do make the move or uh, you know maybe something will come through shortly so um i think that's just a, a good conversation to have you know with a recruiter or, or somebody you know helping you on your job search all right ellie had to hop off she's got another meeting at two um but if Sam and Ishan are open to answering more questions. Uh, we can continue with questions. I don't think I have any left in the chat. Um, Y'all let me know. And I do see, um, Max, your hand is up. I don't know if that's just from before or if you have another question. Yeah, it's from before, sorry. Okay, cool, no, no problem. So curious with the uh, with the contract uh, contracts, is it usually like three to six months contracts, or are they sometimes longer? Yeah, so so it varies. Um, so we I mean we see like short term projects that could be as short as like a week to a month. Um, you know those aren't super common, but you know typically our contracts I would say last about six months or longer. We do occasionally have like a three four month contract, um, but we also have what's called the contract to hire, which um, basically you'll be under contract through tech systems, you know, for three months or six months, however long it is. And that kind of serves as what I like to think of it like a working interview. Um, and, you know, as long as, you know, during that contract period, you're doing well, you know, you're, you're fitting in well with the team, the managers, you know, liking you and wanting to keep you on. Um, then at that point, they'll bring you on, you know, off a contract and on as a permanent employee with that company. So, um, 
you know, it really depends. I mean, it could go anywhere from three, six, 12 months. We have companies that kind of do like, you know, floating contracts where they just, you know, they'll keep extending the date. And we've had folks under contract for two and a half to three years and they just, you know, they're fitting in well and they just keep extending that contract. Um, so it really just depends on, on, you know, what the company's need is at that time. Uh, could you speak a little bit about like what the main difference is between being hired on by the company and being contracted through tech systems, like what that looks like and what are pros and cons of each? Yeah, sure. So, um, so the biggest thing, the biggest, you know, when people hear contract, the biggest thing that pops in their head is, uh, you know, they kind of get a, a red flag and they think benefits, um, you know, obviously benefits under contract aren't the greatest. It's kind of just the, the brutal nature of, of the industry. But, um, you know, I think it's important within IT contracts are very common. I think it's important to, to definitely keep an open mind about that. But, you know, I think specifically for, for folks like yourself who are, you know, going through the boot camp and looking to, you know, get their first role within IT, I think a contract role is a good opportunity to do so um, really just to kind of find out, you know, what it is that you like, you know, you could try out a couple different roles in a couple different contracts. Um, and, you know, maybe you like one over the other and you say, Hey, you know, I kind of want to go after this now. And I, I think it just gives a good opportunity, especially early on in someone's career, just to kind of find, you know, find their niche and find their spot within it and find what they really enjoy. And would you say a majority of your contracts are, uh, contracts for hire? Um, I would say, I don't know if I would say a majority. Um, the one thing I do know, and I, I tell just about everybody this, um, you know, a contract is a contract, but if you go in there and you're, and you're doing a great job and the manager really likes you, they're going to do what they need to do to keep you on board. You know, they're not going to want to lose a good employee, you know, whether that's, you know, extending you again or, or, you know, finding a spot for you permanently or, or finding, you know, maybe we've had examples of people, uh, you know, work in a six month contract and that contract runs out. Unfortunately, you know, it's a project based contract. So, you know, there is a set end date, but they want to keep this person on board. So they, you know, they, they open up a spot maybe on another team for them and, and they'll just, you know, put them in there. So um, I would say, you know, maybe 30, 40, 50% of them are contract to hire, but I always just tell folks, you know, go in there and, and work your ass off and I promise you it will pay off. Like they will do what they need to do to keep a good employee on board. Cool. Yeah. And Greg pointed out contract, you don't work, you don't get paid and no holidays. And that sounds exactly like my past restaurant employers, which weren't contract jobs, but um, it's good to know that, uh, that most, places will give you holidays. Those sound nice. Um, any other questions? Comments? Stories? I see a hand from Joshua. Feel free to go on mic and ask or tell your story. Yeah, I had a question going off on the contract jobs. like. Would it be looked upon or frowned upon if, like, maybe all you wanted to do was contract jobs? Move around kind of thing? No, no, I don't think so. You know, I've, I've came across folks who, you know, I've spoken to them and that's just what they say. Like, you know, honestly, I, I kind of like, you know, trying out a bunch of new things and trying out new roles. And, um, you know, if that's what you enjoy, that's, that's totally fine. It's not going to, you know, knock you by any means. I think the biggest thing to keep in mind and the most important thing to think about is, um, you know, limit employment gaps if you can, you know, if you say take a contract, you work for six months, but then you, you know, take eight months off before you find your next contract. Um, then it just becomes a little bit tougher to, you know, find another job just with that employment gap. But um, I mean, if you're able to consistently land contracts and, and go about it that way, I think that that's absolutely, you know, if that's what you enjoy, go for it. You know, it's, it's not going to hurt you by any means. I don't think so. Okay. I was curious about that. Thank you. Yeah. Just making sure we didn't miss anything in the chat. Devin had to run and she said, thank you for all the great info. Um, Adam said, there are firms trying to build new labor markets designed to avoid the problems of the old ones. What do you think of them? And I'm not sure. I don't Adam, think I fully understand the question. Yeah, Adam, do you maybe want to get on mic and elaborate a little bit?
or let us know in the chat. Okay. Um, I'm just curious what these new firms are and what the new labor markets, uh, what, uh, what kinds of new labor markets they're building. This sounds pretty interesting. Um, but if uh, I don't see anything else in the chat, it's for tech where the company makes the offer. Uh, I'm still not totally clear about the question. I don't know if Sam or Ishan are. Okay, so they can search for the employees that they want. Oh, I see, like instead of the other way around. Uh, okay. Uh, I don't so, know. So are, like Sam, proactively <laughs> searching for employees, is that kind of what you're, what you're talking about? And he said the offers are backed by earnest money. Uh, like for a house. So I'm not super familiar um, with what that is, but I don't know if, uh, if Sam, you or Ishan are, feel free to elaborate. It seems like most people are um, oh, I see. So they can't they can't make an offer to ten thousand people and see who replies. They can only make the offer to people. Oh, is it kind of like a? I don't know. It reminds me of applying to college early decision, where you basically apply, and if you get accepted, you kind of have to to go with that option. But uh, I'm not sure how that how that plays out in uh, in the current labor market. Yeah, I'm 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 not uh, super familiar with that concept, honestly. So I don't know if I could say much about it. Neither am I. That's all good. I will have a little bit of research to do. All right. Well, it looks like most people are heading off. Uh, I do want to, you know, just give any. Oh, Joseph, I see a hand raise. Feel free to. Oh yeah. Hi. Yeah. You know, I'm about halfway through the my, my software development boot camp, but I'm kind of looking into building some personal projects. You know, tech system, I got a question. What would be some good projects to focus on to to show like an employer when if you're applying to like a junior dev position? Thanks so much. I would say, you know, if you're thinking about what you want to do in terms of development, if it's front end, full stack, UI, UX, purely back end, Whatever area you think you have um, the most interest in, those are where I would focus your focus your projects. Oh yeah, thanks so much. And one last question for you, Ishan. Um, you spoke of Azure and AWS, and they're the top cloud pro uh, platforms. What do you think of the uh, of the Google platform? From from the people that I've spoken to, they're all pretty similar. I think in terms of Azure and AWS, specific to the Portland market, that's what most of our customers use. Um, I think the only company that we work with that uses GCP would be Home Depot Quote Center up in Vancouver and Platt Electric Supply out in uh, Beaverton. And typically, I think companies that use GCP know that they maybe are using a, a cloud platform that's not as widely used. So they're very open to folks coming into their environment, not having experience with GCP, but perhaps experience within AWS or Azure. Got it. Everything's in the cloud now. Everything's in the cloud. Frank, to speak to your question between AWS and Azure, which has more jobs, specifically to Portland, I would say uh, AWS, just because Nike's the, the tech giant out here in Portland, and I would say probably 90 to 95 percent of their web applications are hosted on AWS. Awesome. Thank you so much for all of that information. Last chance for questions. Um, 
but I think most people have either exited or gotten their questions answered. Lots of thank yous. And uh, yeah, thank you so much. Uh, there's so much great information there. Um, just so everyone knows, we'll have this video, this recording uploaded to our YouTube channel uh, by tomorrow, you think, Rick? Uh, it'll be uh, late this evening, it'll be up. Great. Um, so you guys are welcome. Thanks so much for, for attending. Uh, we always love to have these talks. And uh, stay tuned on the meetup for the next one. We'll have Dr. Brent Wilson here talking about um, web app, common web application vulnerabilities. So if you're into cybersecurity, this will be another great one. And um, thank you so much. Yeah, that was great, Sam and Ishan. We appreciate it. Thank you. Absolutely. Thank, thank you. Thank you. Yeah, y'all tackled some toughies. <laughs> Yeah, you all have a wonderful day.